Well, I've got a letter here, which is addressed from Victor Chandler to you. Dear Mr. Fitzgerald, I would like to clarify the arrangement between us. I will arrange that an account be open for you and you will place a £500 wager on any of your runners you select, etc, etc. This is clearly a no-lose betting account. What's going on here? What's the deal? What's the quid pro quo oh, here? So he gives you... I never he gives you an... Like that in your life. It's, is this, is this well, addressed to you? What, what, well, who's addressed to son? I haven't had an account like that and don't be too smart with me. I'm not being smart. You're it's trying this... to be a bit smart. I've never had a no-lose betting account with Victor Chandler or any other Victor Chandler. Well, can you explain this letter? I can't explain it to you. I haven't had that account. When did I have a bet with Victor Chandler? Well, what is, what is this letter? I couldn't tell you. Where did you find it? Where did you find this smart man? We were given this by, by someone. That's, that's irrelevant. The point is, it irrelevant. exists. It's what it's about. The point, is, this, this letter, the point is, this letter exists. I've never had a bet with Victor Chandler in my bloody life. Well, what, how can you explain that letter? You. I've seen your Mr. Before. Fitzgerald, this letter raises serious questions you. about your commitment to the fairness of horse racing. Don't you ever tell what me do you about think? my fairness to horse racing? Well, what do you think the average punter would make of such an arrangement? I couldn't tell you what the average punter would make, but I've never had any arrangement or anything with that with Victor Chandler. And if I, if I ever have, if you can prove that I ever had, then I'll, you can that, have all the money you that, want. That looks about as conclusive proof as you can get. Jimmy Fitzgerald has since admitted he has had a special betting arrangement with Victor Chandler, but he denies it was on a no-lose basis. Another letter was addressed to a trainer in Newmarket. Chandler wrote to Gay Kellaway in 1996, wondering whether she'd like the same arrangement as last year. I am prepared to give you two and a half thousand pounds free credit, he said, and should you lose this amount, you do not have to settle. I wanted to talk to you about your special betting accounts with Victor Chandler. My betting account? I've got one betting account with Victor Chandler. Is it a special betting account? Is it a no-lose betting account? I wish it was. It's a sort of account where Never heard of it. he gives you money and you, and you bet with the money and if at the end of the season you've made a loss, he clears your losses? No, I think you got the wrong end of the stick. Well, no, can you explain this letter from, from Victor Chandler to you? It says, uh, I wonder whether you'd like to... Could you, could you, could you explain this letter, please? Have you ever had one of these accounts? Would you like to explain what this letter means, what this arrangement means? You think it's wrong. I think it's very wrong. Did the jockey club go along with you on that? I had mixed responses from the jockey club. On one hand, um, there was, oh, well, we knew that was going on as one, uh, at one end of the sort of spectrum of reaction. The other was, well, these letters are a bit dated, aren't they? The letters you've seen were you know, 93, 96, 97, they're a bit dated. Um, perhaps it's too late to deal with it. But what it actually demonstrated, the actual answer actually demonstrated that there was an unwillingness um, to, to deal with it. And I suspect the reason for that unwillingness was the person I was speaking to knew far better than I did that this behaviour had been going on for years. And they didn't want to rock the boat? Certainly not. Victor Chandler has refused to be interviewed by Panorama about these accounts. He's also tried to stop us from revealing them. In fact, racing's gentleman Bookie was so determined to keep these letters quiet that he went to the High Court to seek an injunction against Panorama using them. But after a two-day private hearing, Mr Justice Morland decided that it was time for the public to be let in on the secrets of the racing business. In my judgment, the contents of the two letters give rise to three questions. They are the integrity and fairness of bookmaking to the betting public, the relationship of bookmakers to trainers and racing stables, and the effectiveness of the jockey club's regulatory role over the sport and industry of horse racing. I am satisfied that those questions are of proper and serious interest and concern to the public, and in particular to the very many hundreds and thousands of people interested in horse racing, very many of whom will place bets from time to time. The Jockey Club have known about these letters since 1998, 
They have now banned such arrangements, but they've taken no action against Victor Chandler. Based in Newmarket, the club is the sole regulatory body for horse racing. Officials like Christopher Foster and the stewards of the club are responsible for licensing trainers and jockeys. Their main priority is to ensure that everyone in the sport adheres strictly to the 243 rules. In dealing with Chandler, they could have used Rule 2, which gives them absolute discretion to exclude or warn off anyone they consider undesirable in the interests of racing. Arrangements of this kind are, are totally unacceptable, aren't they? I think they're quite unacceptable, yes. Um, there's no way uh, we would approve of, 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 of bookmakers effectively paying for privileged information. In that case, why is Victor Chandler's name all over your race courses, uh, sponsoring major races? Uh, I guess because one of the reasons would be that um, the jockey club has no jurisdiction over betting. Uh, we are the regulator of the sport of racing. If you consider someone's behaviour unacceptable and you have the power to warn him off, why didn't you use that power against Victor Chandler? Because I believe that would have been a disproportionate use of that power uh, for, the, for, the, for the actions that Victor Chandler was taking. What he was doing was not an offence uh, under any um, betting regulation and was not an offence under the rules of racing. We have subsequently taken action to make it an offence under the rules of racing. If it happened again, then there is action we could take. But you're not going to do anything about Victor Chandler? No. They were going to do something about Roger Buffham, though. Firm action was needed to stop him talking. Well, I'll read the article first before making any comments. I don't particularly want to stand about here reading it, so... Okay. The once loyal official had now been banned from discussing his work at the Jockey Club. Jockey Club Act to silence Buffman in TV row. Sacked former security to fight and don't stop him talking. Page 8, court date for Buffman over involvement in TV programme. Daily Mail. Jockey Club to take legal action against Buffman and again that dreadful photograph. Jockey Club sues Buffman over television expose. These things don't worry me personally. I think it goes with the territory. But I, I've got a 17-year-old son at grammar school. Um, fortunately, he's off this week study, um, doing home study for his AS um, exams. I've got a 20-year-old daughter at Leeds University, and I think it's not very pleasant for them, and certainly not very pleasant for my wife. Um, and for friends, of course. But, um, you know, I've, personally, I've grown to live with it. The jockey club thought they'd dealt with Buffum. They'd also put every racecourse on alert that Panorama was making a programme. This was an industry rapidly closing ranks. I'm afraid we have to go. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hidden in their confidential documents, there is one story which will forever haunt the Jockey Club. It is a remarkable tale of their abject failure to deal with one man. Brian Wright. A big-time London criminal who until recently operated from an apartment in the affluent setting of Chelsea. Brian Wright. A big-time London criminal who until recently operated from an apartment in the affluent setting of Chelsea Wharf. Wright is now one of Britain's most wanted drug smugglers. For years he was the target of a highly secretive customs operation. At one point they'd even bugged his apartment. Did you take cash? <laughs> Well, from the very early days in the Jockey Club, I 
received a number of reports about this shadowy figure called Brian Wright, who was entertaining jockeys um, and who was present in a private box at a number of race meetings. But again, these were um, intelligence reports. There was very little collateral for them. But the question we had was, what is he actually doing? And we got very few satisfactory answers in the early days as to exactly what Brian Wright was doing. The doping inquiry was ordered when both horses ran suspiciously badly in their respective races. Brave Foot, an 11 to 8 favourite, already at the back of the field here, came in a listless last. In the early 1990s, racing was hit by a series of doping scandals. The jockey club never caught the gang involved, and to this day, no one has ever been prosecuted in connection with them. But this former jockey, banned from racing for selling information to a bookie, has since admitted that he was involved in the dopings. And he says the man who paid him to drug the horses was Brian Wright. When did you start doping horses? I got involved with the doping of the horses in about August, I think, 1990. Uh, at that time, um, at the request of Brian Wright, uh, I think it began at Goodwood. Of course, Willie Carson rode a horse called Hatiel. I think it was one of the first. How many horses did you do? Yeah, we did about twenty-seven races. Over twenty-seven the horses. Of how many between um, no months, just between August and October. And uh, why just that period? Because I got arrested in nineteen ninety October. Um, but don't, that didn't stop Brian Wright, though. Dermot Brown first made these extraordinary admissions to the jockey club two years ago. He listed every horse he doped, pointing out that none of the jockeys had been involved. But we've now discovered that Brown tried to warn the jockey club about this threat to their sport as far back as 1992, a time when the doping gang was still active. Through a journalist, he'd got a message to the then senior steward that he wanted to meet up. But the jockey club didn't want to know. I was willing to give him any information he wanted to. And if Confidentially. He you, if he'd offered you a deal, you would have been prepared to admit that you'd been involved sure. in doping around 20 horses in 1990? Yes. And the systems that were being used and the people behind it? Yes. You would have named Brian Wright? Well, certainly. Definitely. Would you have named the jockeys involved yes. with Brian Wright? If you asked me to, yes. Definitely. And I wouldn't have bothered me in the slightest. When the jockey club finally decided to talk to Brown, they concluded that he was telling the truth. But they'd wasted eight years in obtaining this vital evidence. A journalist came to you in 1992. He came to the jockey club and he urged you to take action on the issues that Dermot Brown was raising. He urged you to talk to Dermot Brown. Did you? Did we talk to Dermot Brown? Uh, no, we, uh, no, we didn't talk to Dermot Brown. Was that uh, a mistake? Well, with 2020 hindsight, it might be. Uh, at the time, it seemed a reasonable decision to those who took those decisions. It was a huge misjudgment by the jockey club. It left Brian Wright free to bribe his way into the heart of racing. He recruited the jockey Barry Wright, despite the name no relation. And it was through this contact that he then met his most influential jockey, Graham Bradley. He began to pay them for exclusive insider racing intelligence. Brian Wright was betting tens of thousands of pounds, and he didn't want to leave anything to chance. Soon enough, he was getting the jockeys to fix races. Once you've given them some information on a couple of horses they've won, um, then they ring you up and say, well, what do you think of this horse today? And I'll say, well, yeah, I think he's a good chance of winning. And I'll say, well, you know, I'll bail you back. And then they ring back and say, look, uh, we'd rather go with, you know, somebody else's horse in that race. Um, you know, do you reckon you can finish second or third or whatever? I say, sure. Um, how much? And they say, you know, something like maybe five grand or something like that. He was doing this in major races? Oh, uh, yeah, fairly big races. Well, ma major races, Cheltenham Festival including, you know. The bigger the race, the bigger the money's at stake, you know. The, the, the bigger the race, the bigger the betting. Wright knew exactly how to keep his riders on side, and the jockey club watched him do it. They later compiled a secret report on Wright's corruption of horse racing. It revealed that jockeys, up to a dozen at a time, 
would be entertained in clubs and hotels where girls would be arranged and drugs supplied. Wright always paid the bill. The report named jockeys Dean Gallagher and Barry Wright as regular users of cocaine, which was supplied by Brian Wright. And all of this at the expense, ultimately, of the racing public. How many jockeys were being paid by Brian Wright? Don't know exactly how many, um, but I saw quite a few. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I knew a lot of jockeys that were involved with him, and you know, we often talked about it and you could see things going on, you knew what was happening anyway. Um, actually seeing them all collecting, you know, I never saw them all collecting the money, but I saw some of them collecting the cash. Who, who did you see being paid? Uh, I saw Brad collecting some, I saw Barry Wright. Bradley? Yeah, I saw um, Barry Wright, most others, collecting cash. Sometimes he'd hand over an envelope, so it didn't have to be Einstein to work out it was cash in it. By the end of the 1990s, Buffum and his intelligence unit had compiled a devastating picture of the extent to which Brian Wright had infiltrated their sport. He'd cultivated trainers and stable lads, and he had close links to more than 20 leading jockeys. Wright had systematically corrupted racing, and the jockey club had failed to stop it. The intelligence we had, and the information we had, from a number of very reliable sources, was that a whole generation of national hunt jockeys had close links with organized crime. A whole generation of national hunt yes, jockeys? absolutely. I, I don't say that lightly. Why should we be concerned about that? Because it strikes at the heart of the integrity of horse racing. A jockey can directly affect the outcome of a race. And unless the jockeys are honest, unless the jockeys are riding their race honestly and fairly to the instructions of their trainers and their owners, then racing has no integrity. Three years ago, Brian Wright's gang was arrested and charged with smuggling nearly 500 kilos of cocaine. It would lead to one of the longest criminal trials in British history and sink the good name of British horse racing. One man escaped arrest. Brian Wright. Panorama tracked him down to northern Cyprus to a remote hotel on the island's northern coastline. One of the world's most wanted drug smugglers, he remains a master of the backhander. And he's still on the run. Mr. Wright, I'm from BBC Panorama. I want to talk to you about corruption in horse racing. I've never told you what's up. What made you like yourself be paying thousands of pounds to jockeys? Can you tell me that? It wasn't just for racing information, was it? The Jockey Club have always had the power to remove Brian Wright from racing, but they've never used it. Yet they've been watching him corrupt the sport since 1985. This was when they first identified him as a well-known criminal who, in breach of their rules, was placing bets on behalf of a jockey. By 1993, they'd linked him to the jockeys Graham Bradley and Barry Wright. You should have warned him off a lot earlier, shouldn't you? I mean, it's... You've got to admit that. Well, if we'd had the evidence, we would have warned him off earlier. We didn't have any evidence until 1996, and from 1996 until 2002, we were either compromised by the fact that, 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 that there were serious criminal investigations going on, or we couldn't act because a judge had put down an order uh, in, in, in court restricting reporting. In court restricting reporting. The Jockey Club's insistence that its hands have been tied over Wright for years is not quite accurate. In 1998, they received intelligence that he'd been entertaining jockeys in the south of Spain. He has a villa here in the luxury resort of Soto Grande. The jockeys were on a golf trip organized by Wright's old friend, Graham Bradley. The Jockey Club could have taken firm action then, but they didn't. Why didn't you remove Brian Wright from racing then? Well, by June 1998, uh, we were aware uh, that uh, Brian Wright was the subject of a serious criminal investigation by the Customs and Excise. And it was... But Mr. Foster, nobody knew about that operation other than Customs until spring 1999. Um, that's not my recollection. 
Uh, that's not my recollection. My recollection is that the uh, police were uh, investigating these matters from early 1997 and that it soon became apparent to them that there was another uh, operation going on with Mr. Brian Wright of a very serious nature. Customs have, have, have told me that you knew nothing about the investigation in 1998. Well, uh, my, my uh, clear understanding Did is that we were in danger of compromising uh, a serious criminal investigation. And I, I, mean, I can't throw I think any... Will, I, I think if, if customs are right, and they should know it was their investigation, then you're wrong on that. Well, I may be, but my clear recollection is that we were unable to take action uh, against uh, Brian Wright for fear of compromising a serious criminal investigation. The scale of corruption Brian Wright had inflicted on racing finally emerged in court when his associates were put on trial for drug smuggling. Three well-known jockeys had offered to stand bail. Others gave evidence in the defense of the former jockey Barry Wright, who was later acquitted. During Graham Bradley's evidence for the defense, he lifted the lid on what Brian Wright had done to racing. Bribing jockeys for inside information had been commonplace. Let us be clear, it is not only Barry Wright who is providing this information to Brian Wright and his team. You were as well, were you not? Yes. Information which, let us also be quite clear, the average punter would probably give his eye teeth for. Yes, very privileged information. You're giving it to other people for their financial advantage. Yes. And in the end also for your financial advantage. Yes. Because when you give a good tip to someone like Brian Brendan Wright, you get a present, do you not? Yes. Thousands of pounds sometimes? Not that sort of money. What is the biggest amount he has paid you? Different nights out and hotels, etc. I, I can't recall the exact biggest present he's ever given me. Every jockey in the country, numbering three or four hundred, has the same and probably does the same. And? how you get your back scratched is apparently nights out at expensive nightclubs. Yes. All the drinks paid for, all the meals paid for, all the rest of it paid for by Brian Brendan Wright. Yes. Envelopes handed over in cash if you've given him a good tip. Occasionally. How much information were you giving him in the 1990s? Lots. Graham Bradley is widely regarded as one of the best horsemen of his generation, recording this the most famous win of his career at Cheltenham. History is made that the 1983 Cheltenham Gold Cup is number two. Brigorn, written by Graham Bradley. Second is number four. Now retired as a jockey. Graham Bradley remains one of the sport's leading personalities. He's a bloodstock agent and an occasional TV pundit. He's also still close to the man he used to fix races for. Brad's a to himself, I suppose. Best pals with Brian Wright. He did very well of it. Many times, you know, Brian Wright would be on the phone to me about a certain race. I no, I'd rather go with Brad's horse. Go with Brad's today, it's OK, fine. So I would stop on my horse so that he could back Brad's to win. Things like that. And vice versa, you know. And I get phone calls from Brad and other jockeys like Brad that we were riding at the time saying, have you been on the phone to Uncle? That's what they called him, or Brian. I said, yeah, and um, he said, you know, so I'm going to go with mine or whatever. I said, fine. And that's the way it worked. Graham Bradley has declined to be interviewed, but we caught up with him at a charity event in Newbury. Mr Bradley, Andy Davis, Panorama. Andy Davis. That's right. I wanted to ask you, for how long were you being paid off by Brian Wright? How long I was being paid off by Brian Wright? That's a silly, awful question. Well, you admitted Where that you? in court. Where you said that you were receiving a lot of money from Brian Wright for giving him privileged information. Um, that's, was, that's true, isn't it? What I said in court, I don't retract because I didn't. I wouldn't want to perjure myself. But it was a very broad spectrum. The answers that I gave to that court. You were selling privileged information to well, Brian I Wright. I wasn't selling privileged information. That's exactly what you admitted in court. I promise you, I never. If you'll read the transcript. I've got the transcript here. It was a very, I've very... I've got the transcript here. Uh, when were you riding? Did they ring you regularly? Yes, they did. 
Uh, let us be clear, it's not only Barry Wright who's providing information to Brian Wright and his team, you were as well, were you not? Yes, you replied, the sort of information which, let us also be quite clear, the average punter would probably give his eye teeth for. Yes, very privileged information, you replied. That's the transcript. It's a very, very broad synopsis. One former jockey, these, one former answer, jockey told answer, us that uh, the, the two of you were fixing second, races second, for Brian Wright. Hang on a second. The answer I gave to that was very broad, and it was about the horses I rode for him. He was an owner, so I'm allowed to give him that sort of information. That's a lie. You've just said in this in this transcript that it was privileged was... racing information, and you know it. What's, what's privileged racing information? Can I tell you what one former jockey said to us? Who's this former jockey? You'll find out in the programme. He how. said that uh, the two of you... Is he a reliable source? You, is he a reliable source? The, uh, he said or is he a lunatic the, nutcase? Because if it's a lunatic nutcase, I'm the, thinking about it. Would you like to hear what he said? He said the two of you were <laughs> fixing races to be honest, for Brian Wright. If it's the chap that I think I am, he's an absolute lunatic multiple liar how many He's other jockeys were being bribed by brian wright what are you doing here actually you haven't got permission from the race course to film here sorry, who are you that's in? that's right, right. yeah you, you, i'm sorry if you courtesy to have asked the race course first you had that well i couldn't save you I, I no, no, it was but right. you did the right thing i know he's got to get weighed in <laughs> taking on the jockeys who got too close to criminals became a priority for roger buffham he was a specialist in intelligence gathering. He set up CCTV cameras on every race course. He brought in new racing intelligence officers from CID and recruited a new network of informants. Pretty soon he knew exactly what jockeys like Bradley were doing, but he had a problem. No matter how accurate the intelligence, the club needed almost criminal standards of proof to take action. So in 1996, he brought in a new rule the fit and proper persons rule. It gave the jockey club the power to take away licenses from jockeys or trainers whose behavior they didn't consider fit and proper. A powerful weapon, but would the jockey club use it? I presented a number of reports on Graham Bradley on at least three occasions um, where it was quite clear to me um, from the reaction I got from the jockey club and from legal advice that there wasn't sufficient resolve and robustness to want to deal with the problem. Why didn't you proceed against him under the fit and proper persons rule? Again, there was no way, in my opinion, the jockey club wanted to deal with Graham Bradley. I certainly suggested that is the way forward. There is no resolve to deal with Graham Bradley. Why did you allow Graham Bradley to continue riding? Um, I'm afraid I'm unable to answer any questions about uh, the Graham Bradley situation. Graham Bradley is one of the seven people against whom we've uh, instituted proceedings following the lifting of reporting restrictions on the series of connected right trials. The Jockey Club has announced that next month Graham Bradley will at last face a disciplinary hearing. Until then, he continues to play an active role in the sport. How many people have lost their licenses under the fit and proper persons rule since, it's, since it was introduced in 1996? One, I think. That's very surprising, isn't it? Well, I don't know whether it's surprising or not. It's, it, it's the fact. One, one uh, person has lost their license on, under the fit and proper rule. Another case revealed by the Jockey Club's secret documents borders on the farcical. This is Man Mood. He is a racehorse enjoying an early retirement. But in 1996, he was at the center of one of the most notorious races of recent times. The Oliver Cromwell handicap chase at Warwick had only attracted two entries, and Man Mood was the clear favorite. The punters were in cavalier mood. They thought they had a dead cert. Man mood jumps it well, and the lead now is about 12 to 15 lengths. What happened next took everyone by surprise. Very quickly, the complexion of the race has changed. Drumstick now has gone on to Man mood, and that all happened in a matter of about uh, 20 strides or so. Drumstick has gone on and jumps that fence a little bit away out to the right there. Man Mood has not answered the urgings at all of Graham Bradley. And he's left alone because he's pulled up Man Mood before the ditch. So we've just got the one left in it. It's Drumstick. 
and the jockey takes a long look over one shoulder, over the other shoulder, still can't see where his rival is, there isn't one. Drumstick finishes alone in the Oliver Cromwell handicap chest. The bookies were furious. As far as they were concerned, it wasn't just the jockey whom Man Mood had taken for a ride at Warwick that day. They discovered that thousands of pounds had been put on the outsider moments before the race started. They wrote to the jockey club reporting an unusual number of professionals backing the winner. The chief betting officer at William Hill, Mick Norris, was one of those reporting highly unusual betting transactions. The bookmakers have a brilliant intelligence system. They know what's going down and they make it their business now and you'd expect them to because they have to look at their liabilities. So they knew that there was something wrong with the race. Norris knew there was something wrong with the race. And uh, we received those messages from Bowler to say they were not happy and they were considering not paying out. The Jockey Club launched an inquiry, but they needed the bookies to hand over evidence of a betting scam. And soon enough, William Hill's Mick Norris supplied it. In a detailed statement to the Jockey Club, he concluded, based on my experience of watching horse racing for 30 years, this bore all the hallmarks of being a fixed and crooked race. It was vital evidence. The Jockey Club moved to prosecute. Then, disaster for Buffum. Mick Norris informed the Jockey Club he wanted to withdraw his statement. When did he withdraw it? Oh, a few days later. I got this very sheepish phone call saying, I'm sorry, but my board won't allow me to continue with this statement. I have to withdraw it and please send it back to me. Did you call him up? Oh, yes, yes. We tried in the usual way to persuade him, but it was a decision of his board. It wasn't Norris's decision, and that's my understanding of it. And what did Norris say to you about... Oh, he's very apologetic, extremely apologetic. But he wasn't prepared to go against the wishes of his board, quite understandably. So when the bookies withdrew that statement, you couldn't continue with the Absolutely not. Case. We, we were absolutely dead in the water. And so the inquiry was abandoned, and Man Mood found a new owner. Without betting records, there was simply no evidence that the race had been fixed. Despite numerous requests for an interview, William Hill will not tell Panorama why they withdrew their evidence in this case. So we decided to go directly to the man who was in charge at the time, the current chairman, John Brown. Mr. Brown, yeah. Andy Davis, Panorama. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about William Hill's handling of the uh, Man Mood case, if, if I may. Could I ask you a few questions, Mr. Brown? Moments later, Mr. Brown reconsidered the request. Could you explain, as chairman of the company, could you explain why, could you explain why the company didn't help the jockey club? Would you like to do an interview now? Would, would you, you step in the door? Would you like to do an interview now? Of course, I'll come in the door. Can we bring the camera? No, no, no camera. You step in the can door. We, can we bring the camera? No, you step in the door. You got your camera going now, have you? Yes, have we you? have. Yeah, got the sound on, have you? We have. Yes. Good, yeah. Will you step in the door and I'll talk okay. to you? Okay. Okay. Can we bring the camera no. with us? Step in the door and I'll talk to you. Aware we were still recording, Mr. Brown was asked about his company's lack of cooperation over the Man Mood case, but he had no recollection of it. Did William Hill withdraw a statement to the Jockey Club over the Man Mood case? Not to my knowledge, no. Were you chief executive William of the company Hill, at the I, time? Yes. Let me ask you this. Did William Hill send a statement to Roger Buffum at the head of security saying that they thought it was a fixed and crooked race? Not that I'm aware of. Did Mick Norris send a statement? Not that I'm aware of. Well, he did. I'm telling you, he well, did. OK. Well, you're telling me he did. I'm telling you I'm unaware of that. Thank you. Clearly, the Man Mood case remains an embarrassing episode for all concerned. What did you think of the lack of support from William Hill in the Man Mood investigation? Well, I think it's, it, 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 it's an example of the difficulty um, that the Jockey Club faces uh, in um, examining potential corruption of races. Uh, our inability to get hold of uh, betting information um, and certainly uh, the lack of uh, betting information 
uh, in a number of, of cases has prevented us from taking um, matters any further. You haven't answered my question. What did you think of William Hill's action in that particular investigation? Unhelpful. Uh, definitely unhelpful. Uh, if their action was unhelpful, did you ever go back to William Hill and say to them that if they continued to hinder your investigations, you'd consider taking action against them? Well, uh, there's very limited D yes action. Or, yes or there no? Is did, very did you ever, can I just ask you, did you ever go back and say There is very limited them? action that we could take. Yes or no? There, I'm sorry, there is very limited action that we could take uh, a, 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 a against uh, a betting organization. So the important question is here, Mr. Foster, why did you do nothing about William Hill in 1996? Because we don't have jurisdiction over betting organizations. You can warn bookies off race courses. That is a jurisdiction. That would be an abuse of our power. The threats to the integrity of racing are as serious today as they ever have been. Once again, organized crime is targeting the sport. This is racing in Hong Kong. Until recently, it was a favorite location for some of Britain's best jockeys, seeking rides in the winter season. But they're hard to spot these days. The once celebrated invasion of British jockeys has turned into an ignominious retreat. Kieran Fallon is Britain's current champion jockey. Three years ago, the Hong Kong Jockey Club warned him to stop associating with a suspected Chinese gangster. He repeatedly ignored the warnings and when challenged on the matter, tried to cover it up. In July 2000, he was advised not to reapply for a license and a confidential report was sent to the Jockey Club in Britain. Kieran Fallon is either unwittingly or knowingly being used, it concluded. The risk of damage to the reputation of Hong Kong racing is high if he continues his relationship. Kieran Fallon is still riding in Britain. Do you think what Kieran Fallon did was fit and proper behaviour for one of your jockeys? Uh, in view of the legal proceedings uh, which have been uh, instigated by Kieran Fallon in connection uh, with the publication by the News of the World uh, of a part of a Hong Kong Jockey Club report, uh, I am uh, unable to, to engage in this uh, particular topic. John Egan is another jockey who won't be returning to Hong Kong in a hurry. John Egan is another jockey who won't be returning to Hong Kong in a hurry. He's a wanted man there charged with taking a bribe of 20,000 Hong Kong dollars from a racehorse owner. He denies it, but he's also refusing to go back to Hong Kong to face the charge. We understand that the Chinese police have written to the jockey club, expressing their concern that John Egan continues to be licensed to ride in Britain. Uh, our judgment is that this is not a matter of such seriousness that the integrity of racing in this country is threatened. That is why he continues to ride in this country. And he's refusing to go back to answer a charge of, of corruption, and you think that that's okay to I'm, continue I'm, licensing I'm, him? I'm not taking a view on whether... But you should. You're the regulator, Mr. Foster. No, I'm taking a view on whether his activity is a threat to the integrity of racing in this country. And you don't think it is? I don't believe it to be. In your opinion, should Kieran Fallon be riding in, in the UK at the moment? On the strengths of the Hong Kong report, I would say not. John Egan? No. On the strength of the reports as I understand them to be. I don't believe so. I believe that where there's any connection with any crime, organised or otherwise, of the, uh, and the information is as strong as it is, um, I believe as a protective measure, the Jockey Club would be wise not to license such people. The alleged links between British jockeys and suspected Chinese criminals are not confined to Hong Kong. In Britain, the Manchester police have been investigating the infiltration of racing by Chinese triads, as this secret document reveals. The jockey club know all about it, but when they were asked by the police for just £3,000 to assist investigations in Hong Kong, they said they couldn't help. 
Kieran Fallon, here riding the Queen's horse, Right Approach, has declined to discuss these issues with Panorama. We can reveal that since leaving Hong Kong, the Jockey Club have observed Fallon mixing with suspected Chinese criminals on a British racecourse. Fine. Andy Davis, BBC Panorama. Are you a fit and proper person to be wearing the Queen's colours on the British race course? Because effectively you were stopped from racing in Hong Kong after being seen associating with a Chinese gangster. Isn't that correct? You've also been associating with Chinese criminals in Britain. Why don't you want to address... Why don't you want to address these issues, Mr Fallon? Kieran Fallon is on the verge of winning his fifth title as Britain's champion jockey. He claims he's never knowingly mixed with triad gangsters. Last month, the Jockey Club and Panorama went face to face in the High Court. At issue, the Jockey Club's secret files. And a final bid to keep evidence in this programme hidden. Like all these things, it's... Um, they're in the laps of the gods, as they say. Almost literally. After a two-day hearing, Mr Justice Gray ruled that it was in the public interest that these documents were revealed. It has been made clear on behalf of the BBC that this case is not solely that the Jockey Club failed to take effective action, but also that if effective action cannot be taken, more effective means must be found to preserve the integrity of racing. The BBC had won. For Roger Buffum, it was a vindication of his decision to blow the whistle on racing. The Jockey Club now has a new head of security. He's Major General Jeremy Phipps, a former head of the SAS. We met him with his PR man, John Maxey. We're not filming now, are we? Jeremy Phipps has already made his mark at the Jockey Club with a series of dawn raids on a number of trainers' yards. It was part of a random testing program designed to identify the performance-related drug EPO. This is an area where the Jockey Club has been hugely successful. Doping has virtually been eliminated from the sport. The stewards of the club have introduced a new integrity review committee and they're lobbying the government to give them wider powers to deal with the threat of crime. The turf's hierarchy say they've always acted in the best interests of the sport and that they remain robust and vigilant regulators under the direction of their new head of security. Does the jockey club have the resolve, the backbone, to regulate the sport properly? Yes. Of course, remember, we haven't got any statutory power. You're saying do. it has? Yes. I do think it has got the backbone, yes. Certainly. That's, that's not what you really think, is it? It certainly is. Why do you say that? Because that's not what you told Roger Buffham when you met him recently in London. Earlier this year, General Phipps presented a very different perspective on the Jockey Club. When he discovered that Roger Buffham was in touch with Panorama, he asked him to come to London for a chat. Anticipating that the former SAS man might put pressure on Buffham not to blow the whistle on racing's corruption, we secretly recorded the meeting. In the course of the hour-long conversation, there weren't any threats. There were, however, some remarkable admissions about the jockey club's lame response to the threat of corruption. A response, though, which General Phipps pointed out was improving. It didn't take long for the subject of Graham Bradley's admissions in court to come up in the conversation. He's trying to get a dynamite. Yeah, they are. I mean, Brad's got a shot in the fucking mouth for that. Good. We wrote to yeah. Brad, and we wrote to Brad's system. Did anyone say anything? Yeah. Too I mean, it's pretty horrendous stuff, isn't it? I mean, and all exactly what you said, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm not but afraid but no, no one wants to do anything about it, though. That's not the problem I got. Well, all that now. Well, I hope you make sure they do. I had a David Aldrich in my office this afternoon. Mm. And I said, why the fuck have we not done anything about this yeah. before? But apart from the odd warning, nothing's happened. Nothing's happened. No. 
Don't you think that's reprehensible? And, and it's not. It's not just. It is. Yeah. It is actually the backbone. That's not terribly strong. You told him that uh, the, the backbone of the jockey club isn't terribly strong. I don't believe that was the case. Those, those are your exact words. Are they? I'm sorry, I dispute well, let, that. But well, let, let me let me refresh your memory because these are your comments, which uh, are transcribed word from word for word from that uh, meeting, which was uh, recorded. Yeah. Uh, and your words are: "It is actually the backbone that is not terribly strong." And that came from Mr. Buffum. That was from your meeting with Roger Buffum on the 30th of April yeah. in London. Yeah. How can the jockey club run this sport effectively if they haven't got the stomach, the backbone to regulate the sport? I do believe they have got the backbone. But you said, why were you saying to Roger Buffum that it's not terribly strong? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I disagree with what that was, that transcript, I, I really do. Do you still think members of the jockey club are, and I quote you, fucking ignorant? No, I didn't say that. I you did say it. that? Oh. You did say that. Roger Buffum, uh, he starts talking about the conflict of interest. And you reply, and also you've got to think about jockey club members as well. Roger Buffum says, the club members. And you reply, they're fucking ignorant. And Roger Buffum says, who gets Jeremy, indignant? Jeremy, do, you think, do you think they're fucking Jeremy, ignorant? I'm, one word we do, because actually we can, also, ask, we can deal with you, this. Right. And no, and I'm not sorry, John, these are legitimate questions. They are. And you can ask this them. is a matter of Andy, public you can, interest. Andy, and you, I think no, one means ask stop. them in one minute. No, no, I just want one no, word no. with Jeremy. Exactly the same questions. I, uh, in, John, in one minute, Andy. No. What do you think about your system of licensing, General Fitz? Let's go. I'll come back in a minute. Because you said your system of licensing is crap. General Phipps had been pulled up at the first hurdle but the withdrawal was to be only temporary. It appeared that his PR director wanted to gently point out to him that he must have had a perfectly good reason to be quite so critical of the jockey club. Can I ask you what uh, your public relations officer just said to you? Well, he reminded me uh, why I met Roger Buffon at the Tapsters in London, Victoria. I arranged to meet Roger in order to draw out from Roger exactly what he had done to try and identify if indeed he was writing a book, if indeed he had been contacted by BBC and by newspapers. I ask in, order to draw, in order to draw everything out from him, indeed he was writing a book, if indeed he had been contacted by BBC and by newspapers. I ask in, order to draw, in order to draw everything out from him, I had to go along with some of the things that he had been uh, talking about. During the last two years, the gambling laws in Britain have undergone a major review. As a result, betting on horse racing and the activity of bookmakers will soon be subject to much tighter controls. Under present government plans, however, the regulation of horse racing will remain as it is, firmly in the hands of the 250-year-old jockey club. Is anyone at the jockey club going to reconsider their position about all of this? Well, that will be for the stewards of the Jockey Club to decide. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think on any evidence to produce to me today uh, there's, there's, there's anything that uh, uh, anyone need feel guilty about. As I've said, we, we act uh, when there is evidence. I don't recall a situation, I've been here a long time, I don't recall any situation where evidence was available to us and we didn't take action. Have you considered your resignation? No. Do you think you should? No. For the romantics of the turf, there has always been a mercurial edge to this sport. But it would be wrong to dismiss 15 years of systematic corruption as merely part of racing's roguish allure. This is a major industry far too exposed to corruption and in need of firm regulation. The jockey club, it seems, have tried for years to keep the sins of racing hidden from the public like their club, a private affair. Had it not been for one man, 
a most unlikely whistleblower, they may well have succeeded. The irony is not lost on me. I feel um, sad in many ways that uh, over the last few years um, the Jockey Club has been aware of a number of people, a significant number of people, including jockeys and trainers, who have been involved in corruption or corrupt activity. And at the end of the day, the only person they forced to go is the person who was trying to address these issues and these problems on behalf of horse racing. And that is me.